And uh, good afternoon to my colleagues who are joining me here today across the country. And I am so grateful for Plameca uh, for bringing me back. I want to just introduce myself to you some more. I am originally from the Boston area. Um, I grew up uh, um, I grew up in a small town outside of Boston uh, called Rivera. If you've ever flown into Logan Airport, then welcome to my neighborhood. In 2006, I graduated from Phone School Dental Hygiene, which is the first dental hygiene school in the world. So I am a very proud uh, graduate. Um, and I completed my master's degree um, in 2018 through Phone School of Dental Hygiene as well. In 2010, um, against the, the, the will of my mom, I, I moved to Washington, D.C., and I almost immediately became active in the uh, D.C. Dental Hygienist Association. Um, my mission and my, uh, my drive has always been to transform the profession to get us up to speed, to change the way we perceive ourselves and to even cha change the way our colleagues perceive us as just um, dental hygienists. We are professionals, we are providers, and um, there's so much more that we can do. So that's been my goal and that's been my mission and it's come true for me. Uh, in 2015, I totally transformed the way that I was practicing the setting that I was in and even my patient population when I started working in oral surgery as implant care specialist, which is actually a role that I've innovated and transformed into implant care practitioner. So uh, my dental hygiene colleagues and even some, some uh, dentist friends uh, know me most for this, for uh, being able to break down walls and get the dental hygienist working alongside oral surgeons, especially to uh, help work collaboratively with them to care for the patients with advanced implant dentistry. So I do have a, a disclaimer. Um, this is a course on home care. This is also a program that is not only definitely scientific, but very heavily based off of my clinical experience, which is part of the evidence-based practice. So there are images in here um, with brushes, especially, um, and, and certain products, but in no way, shape, or form am I suggesting that you go and buy these things. I am just trying to share my experience with you and what works best, uh, what has worked best for, for my patients on an individual basis. I really want to stick to home care. Um, uh, unfortunately, there's just so much to talk about in, in, in implant dentistry, especially as it um, concerns the dental hygienist because our dental hygiene curriculum is lacking. So if you came here to ask questions about instrumentation or maybe the latest modalities like lasers or anything like that, um, I'm going to encourage you to first check out On Demand, um, uh, uh, a program that um, Plemacher and I partnered with. I, I think we did this in June or July, I can't remember. But if you visit planmecca.com slash webinar, you'll be able to watch this very comprehensive uh, program on demand. So I'm, I'm excited uh, to talk about and really just be able to focus on um, the best home care practices, the, the, the best oral measures uh, concerning our patients with dental implants. But first, I'd like to get to know about my colleagues. So I do have a poll that we're going to launch. It's a, it's a two-part poll. There's two questions there. And I, I'd like to know who's here with me today. Um, you can feel free to use the chat box. We're using the chat box to be very social. If you want to let us know um, where you're coming, where you're tuning in from today, um, uh, feel free to get social in the chat box. If you have any questions, um, please be sure to use the question and answer box. But I, I'd like to know um, who's with us today. What is your primary role in dentistry? Um, are, do we have educators with us here today? Do we have um, clinicians, dentists, dental hygienists with us here today? And then the second question is, um, what home care techniques are you prim primarily teaching to your, your patients with dental implants for, inter for interdental biofilm management? Like what, what is your go-to? 
Um, is it pretty general in your practice? Or are you in a situation where you are practicing true individualized care? Or do you know that it's kind of, you know, multi, it is multifactorial, but what is your first go-to when you are, your patients come into the office for um, maybe some oral hygiene education uh, for home care and dental implants? What is your first, first go-to? What is the first thing you, you introduce to your patient? And Peggy, whenever you think it's it's we've got good enough responses there, you can go ahead and, and share the slide or share the poll results, I'm sorry. All right, great. So welcome to the uh, diversity that's with us here today. Um, I'm so happy to see that we have our dentist colleagues joining us because I can tell you in my experience, um, we, need, we need you here. We need dentists um, in these courses to learn uh, what dental hygienists are doing um, so that we can all be on the same page. We need to be educating in an interprofessional setting. And I'm not surprised, um, I'm not surprised at all to see that many of us are using oral irrigators. So that's pretty cool. That's good to know. Thank you so much. Okay. So why are we here? Why is this important? Uh, what kind of attitudes do we need to um, uh, uh, get ready to um, uh, receive from our patients? And what kind of attitudes do we need to have to be able to really serve this population? Because dental implants are the standard of care for the replacement of missing teeth. We've got to get ready. We, the, the, some of the, um, uh, the dental market um, uh, reports that have been released to forecast what our future looks like say that by 2024, six, uh, the, the uh, dental implant markets are forecasted to reach $6.81 billion. Well, it's getting ready to be 2021. So the future is today. It's right now. This is the standard of care for the replacement of missing teeth. So we have to make sure that we are prepared for the reality of dentistry. It is widely known that um, complications, especially biological complications uh, pertaining to uh, uh, peri-implant diseases are observed as early or late complications and require the diagnostic and therapeutic therapeutic experience on the part of the treatment provider. So, you know, I have to say this, the success of your patient, the success of their, their, their oral health really depends on you. Um, it's important for us to understand that the endpoint goal of dental in, implant treatment, and this is a quote that I took right out of the mouth of Dr. Myron Nevins, who is uh, a mentor of mine, a world-renowned surgeon, periodontist, who the likes of Dr. Paul Rose and Dr. Um, uh, Stephen Frome look at him towards a mentor. But uh, I was in a symposium and he was up there lecturing and the last slide he had up there pertaining to peri-implant diseases, how to prevent them, is that the end point goal is that the dental hygiene practitioner and the patient must be able to maintain the uh, area. We know that maintenance the literature clearly, clearly, clearly lists maintenance um, as the cornerstone, as the center of the of it all, and not not just with dental implants. We know um, we know in oral health how important it is um, for for patients to have access to dental hygiene care, but um, uh, most importantly, understand the why behind it. So we really. Um, the consensus, when you look, when you look at the research, the, the consensus is that we definitely do need more research. And, um, you know, dentistry is one of those uh, um, bodies of, of, of research. It's, it's, it's got one of the smaller bodies of research in medicine because there's so, we have more questions that we, that we ask or more knowledge that we have to know. And there's not always the evidence out there to, um, you know, support you know, what are, what are challenges or the decision that we're trying to make. But there's definitely a misunderstanding about peri-implant tissues. 
There's a misunderstanding about the perimucosal seal. There's a misunderstanding about the severity of disease and how peri-implantitis compares to um, uh, periodontal disease. But one thing is for sure, biofilm, biofilm, biofilm. I wanna thank the patient population um, uh, uh, of patients who have dental implants because they really have paved the way um, to more of, a, of an environment where we can practice individualized, individualized based care because it takes time um, when you are approaching dental implants, especially if there is an active disease. That's why prevention, prevention, prevention is key. Um, and uh, we've, we, we have to put more focus on the perimucosal seal. What exactly does that mean? And what are the different uh, uh, um, modalities that are, are, are safest to use? Not only, not only in a professional setting, but we also have to make sure that what we are giving our patients to take home with them is also safe for them to use as well and, and will not disrupt that perimucosal seal. So let's look a little bit more into the tissue here. So when I, when we talk about the uh, implant soft tissue interface, what we're talking about is the part of the, uh, the, the smooth surface of the abutment that is facing the tissue. Okay, so this is, this is where your, your perimucosal seal is. I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I get there, let's, let's just break down a little bit more um, what makes up the, the tissue surrounding dental implants. So we know that inside the pocket, inside the sulcus, we have non-characterized epithelium. However, that can depend on uh, where the um, uh, dental implant is placed because ideally we want, uh, we want non-characterized in the sulcus, but we also want characterized um, uh, on the surface. We want good characterized tissue. So it, it really depends on pl placement, but you can have either, you can have both non-characterized in the socket and outside um, in the tissues as well. Then we know that we have, we don't have PDL. I think that's widely known now. I don't think we have to stress that too much um, that dental implants lack periodontal ligaments. Um, so we have the junctional epithelium that comes from the bone and into the tissue as a way of attachment. And then Super, we have um, uh, above the bone, uh, the supercrestal zone of connective tissue, these, these collagen fibers that if you can picture figure eights bundled up all together that run circumferentially around the uh, dental implant. And what this does is hold, it, this is where we get the perimucosal seal. So the difference between natural teeth and dental implants and the attachment is just that. With natural teeth, we have, atta we have attachment through the PDL. In dental implants, because we don't have PDL, we only have adaption. And because we have adaption, because we have this gentle seal, that's the controversy. Um, uh, you know, are the things that we're doing or are the, th are the things that we're doing in practice and are the things that we are recommending for our patients to do at home, are they really safe? Are they really effective? And most importantly, are they realistic? So what, what, um, you know, what are the, some of the etiologies? Because you have to understand, uh, you know, what causes it and it's multifactorial so that we can understand and, and help um, uh, educate our patients uh, to the risks so that they could almost kind of feel threatened by the consequences so that they can, um, be their best when it comes to home care, okay? So, I mean, there, there are so many different things that cause uh, peri-implant diseases. It, it really is multifactorial. But for today, I'd like to focus on, um, uh, you know, some of the things that, uh, some of the etiologies that I feel like we, we play a huge role in as professionals. And those are the uh, biological and then the non-biological. So what do I mean by this? So there are, um, uh, it's biofilm really, um, but you know, peri-implant diseases can occur from either, uh, you know, bacterial biofilm, bacterial plaque or irritants or um, foreign factors that somehow uh, get in that uh, uh, environment surrounding the implant 
and um, accumulate biofilm, accumulate plaque. So um, there's been some questions about whether uh, dental floss is a culprit. Um, and obviously we know that the restorative design plays a huge role in the accumulation of biofilm and the accumulation of plaque and the challenges for, for the clinician and even, and even the patient. And then we know, we know cement, but these are the things that, um, these are the things that, especially in the case of floss and cement and the prosthetic design, these are definitely things that can um, be prevented, preventive, but you have to be aware, especially of the prosthetic design um, and what challenges a poor design can present to the patient. And when we're classifying peri-implant disease, we, need to, we, we, we really should be classifying it um, by the cause by the condition. This was a, this was a study, uh, a clinical study that was done by um, a group of periodontists and it was published in the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry. It was a small study of 152 patients with 207 implants. And you can see um, the breakdown of uh, what they did was they took patients that had peri-implant disease and then classified it by the cause. So in this particular, um, situation of 207 implants, you have 8.5% that are that are were itrogenic factors. You have exogenic factors. It's it's multifactorial, but in any circumstance, it always ends up being biofilm. You know, all of these things here lead to more potential for inflammation. You know, biofilm is, um, it's a deadly disease. It's, it's, it's complex, it's, it's highly, um, uh, highly organized, three-dimensional. Uh, you know, the bacteria can communicate and it will adhere and start to grow anywhere where there's moisture and a, surf and a surface. Um, also, biofilm can contain other microorganisms um, like, yeasts and, and viruses. So we need to take it more seriously. And um, that goes with our perception of it and how we um, communicate this information to our patients. We, we, we can't just, uh, we have to stop calling it plaque. We, we, we really need to have to recognize it for what it is. Um, we know that you don't have, we know that biofilm causes diseases. Biofilm and the systemic, and the systemic link in your risk factors, but it starts with biofilm. You don't have to have visible calculus and plaque on the patient's teeth or, or implants um, uh, in order for them to have a problem. In, in my uh, professional opinion, I feel like if your patients are showing up in your office and they have, you know, they have plaque accumulation, they have calcus, they have stain. Um, I feel like I failed on my end because I didn't change this, this, this person's attitude about themselves to make them want to take better care, to make them want to um, better, better, uh, be a better advocate for them, their, their selves. We have to, we can't do it all for our patients. Um, we have to hold them accountable for some things. But when it comes to um, challenges with home care because of prosthetic design, I hold dentistry accountable for that. You know, the role of the dental hygienist and the dental implant workflow is crucial. We should be seeing those patients pre-surgical, post-surgical, while they're in their provisional stage, and obviously um, at their final, restor final restoration stage. Um, but pre-surgical is so important because you have to make sure the patient is healthy overall, meaning oral and systemic. And dental hygienists, that's what we're responsible for, figuring out and, and helping to assess. That's a role that we play, is to um, help um, decide, is this patient a good candidate? And if they're not, how can we get them to that point? And if it's because of poor home care and uncontrolled um, diabetes or uncontrolled periodontal disease, that needs to be taken care of in the pre-surgical phase. Maintenance, post-surgical, oh, it's so important because you can lose a dental implant in the, in the post-surgical stage. The provisional, 
the provisional. When I see a patient in their final stage and the restoration is poor, the provisional is the prototype. So how, how was it that the final restoration, if the, if the provisional is the prototype for the final restoration, during the maintenance phase, when the patient is in their provisional, that's the ideal time to be um, working collaboratively with the doctor, the patient, and, and yourself as a dental hygiene provider um, to make sure that the restorative design will not present any challenges um, or will not create uh, an environment that is non-maintainable due to the design. So I feel like all stages of implant dentistry are important, but that provisional stage when the patient is in the chair with the dental hygienist, we need to be critically appraising that prosthetic design to make sure uh, that it, it is not a, it's not poorly designed because this is what can happen. Food trapping, um, you know, it just so I'm it increases the patient's risk. So let's get into the home care portion. Um, and I am going to start out with talking about um, what home care looks like today, um, um, uh, knowing that on this, this particular call, most, most of our colleagues here are using oral irrigators. But that, I would say, has, has uh, probably happened maybe within the, like, the last two years, because before that, the recommendation was 360 flossing. So we're going to start with what it might look like today, um, take you, go for a walk through the research, and then I want to finish with um, an emphasis on home care, the best oral hygiene measures for your So I'm going to implant patient. So what are we possibly teaching our patients now? So I'm going to demonstrate to you some of my favorite products that I recommend to my patients with dental implants. I'm going to demonstrate to you how to use Superfloss. You would start with this stiffened den. You would thread it through one side of your dental implant, wrap it in around so that it hugs the tongue side of your dental implant, and thread it through the other side. Now I'm actually going to demonstrate the motion with the regular side of the floss only because it's easier for me to show. You so this was me in 2012. Um, I think that uh, there still is controversy uh, whether or not 360 flossing is the appropriate oral hygiene measure for patients with dental implants. And in order to really um, figure that out, we have to take a look at the, the research. We have to, we have to see, um, you know, it, it, what does the evidence say, right? Um, we are, um, our goal is to practice evidence-based dentistry, evidence-based practice. Not only does that take into account, uh, account the evidence, but we also have to give equal attention to clinical experience and also the um, what's best for our patients. So we know that evidence-based uh, practice is using the best science to make decisions, but man, it can be overwhelming. We have to be able to sift through the different quantity um, of, of, of literature to find the quality, and then obviously use your judgment for, for what's best for your patient. So we have uh, uh, in, in, in dentistry, we talk a lot about uh, um, uh, observational and interventional uh, studies. Your observational studies is when the investigator uh, gathers information without intentionally controlling or manipulating the environment of the subjects. So um, examples are your clinical studies, um, even surveys, and uh, dental hygienists can contribute to the body of evidence concerning observational, stu uh, observational studies. You know, if you have a case report uh, that you want to report on and publish, that's your contribu contribution. And then we also have your interventional studies. So these are the studies where the investigator begins to manipulate the environment in an effort to strengthen the study or to eliminate bias. And these are, uh, when you look at the uh, uh, research hierarchy, these are um, uh, some of the 
more respected uh, forms of study. And um, uh, these are um, uh, considered kind of gold stand standard um, when it comes to dental research. But what do you do when these types of studies are lacking in your in your your clinical question? So let's take a look at um, let's take a look at uh, the five steps to evidence based practice. So we first start with a question. Um, uh, the PICO, we might know it as PICO, um, uh, what this takes into consideration is the patient, the intervention being used, what are you comparing to that um, uh, inter intervention, and what do you expect the outcome to be? So since 1995, the, the PICO question, the format has kind of been um, gold standard when you're trying to formulate the question to the to the to the, the the decision that you're trying to make, but for this particular demonstration, I'm using a PIO. Right? I've, I've formatted the, the the question as a PIO, meaning I took out the comparison, and this was necessary for me to do when trying to find out about uh, the 360 flossing method because the body of research is so small. So when the body is re of research is so small, you can then modify and change the format of your, your research question to better meet your need. But we first start with asking the question. So as an example, in dental implants, does 360 flossing, does the 360 flossing method result in peri-implantitis? Next, you would um, acquire Okay, you would do your, your um, you would systematically assess for the most uh, current scientific evidence that's out there pertaining to your question. Next, you would appraise, you would uh, critically appraise the, the literature that you found um, for strength, weaknesses, biases, and most importantly, is it practical? Um, uh, what's the validity of, of the outcome? And then you'd apply. Um, uh, you would apply this evidence in your practice. And then most importantly, you have to assess the outcome. And if it doesn't, uh, you know, if you're not getting results, you have, you have to go back to the drawing board. So I just want to give an example of um, critically appraising, because let me, let me get, get uh, really real with you. I feel like critical, critical thinking especially in my experience as a uh, clinician, educator, I, I am a um, uh, part-time uh, uh, adjunct faculty at Phone School of Dental Hygiene. So from a clinical perspective, from an education perspective, um, and then as an international speaker, uh, I feel like we need to focus more on uh, critical thinking because that's definitely what you need when you, when you are trying to assess the research. This is what you should be doing before you apply it, apply it to practice. What is the research saying? Um, so if you take a look at this, these, these clinical practice guidelines um, were published, I think it was 2016, but for a while, this is really what all of the speakers, um, uh, at least what I was experiencing, you know, all of the speakers that were speaking on the best practices for dental, for dental implants were um, you know, really lifted up these guidelines. Now, clinical practice guidelines are developed by um, government or professional organizations, and um, they are developed based on comprehensive analysts of the evidence on a popular topic. We know that this is a popular talk topic, but it's supposed to be um, on the, the uh, research hierarchy. It's supposed to be at the top of that pyramid. Um, I actually critic. I, I wrote a critically a, a critical appraisal on this, these particular guidelines, and I and I co-authored it with a dental hygienist whose focus is on critically appraising clinical practice guidelines. So um, I don't have. Let me see if I can get the chat box. I want to see the chat box. So just by looking at these guidelines here, uh, what is the first thing? When you're critically appraising this, remember we we don't want to be uh, we we have to be aware of bias. 
when you're looking at these guidelines in the chat box, is there something that uh, uh, just uh, sticks out to you that might affect the way uh, how you perceive and take in the information that's given by these guidelines? If anybody's in the uh, um, chat box wants to go ahead and give that a try. Okay, seeing that we have no participation here. Okay, that's that's fine. But um, if you take a look, we have that this is a, these are clinical practice guidelines that were sponsored by Colgate. Okay, and focusing on the patient education and at-home maintenance uh, recommendation, uh, it talks very highly of uh, using toothpaste that contains triclosan, and also, uh, you know, uh, rinses or gels that contain chlorhexidine gluconate. There's so much to talk about with um, implant dentistry, and, and we can have a full discussion on chlorhexidine gluconate, but I can tell you that I think that we are starting to, as a profession, come to terms with um, the fact that chlorhexidine gluconate might not be the most um, uh, 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 effective when treating peri-implantitis. But, you know, when you look at this, this is a, this is a clinical, clinical practice guideline with a lot of bias, meaning the group that put this together um, uh, was, um, you know, received, they were, they, were, they were paid to do so. So when you have, when the, when the evidence is lacking, when you don't have, you know, when you can't find the system, uh, uh, systematic reviews or whatever it might be, what is the next best thing? Well, according to the evidence-based dentistry for the dental hygienist uh, textbook here that um, I do recommend for uh, dental hygienists to have in their armatorium of resources, but in following an evidence-based process where there is a lack of robust clinical evidence, one then relies upon other sources of evidence. So what does that mean? Uh, that means we have to go a little bit lower um, on that, that uh, hierarchy there. And so we need to take a look at and consider, especially when we talk about um, when it comes to dental implants, because we know that the education is lacking so much. Um, we've got to look to the experience of the clinicians. We've got to look to uh, the outcomes that the, 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 the dental hygienists and the dentists who are practicing this evidence-based dentistry, um, you know, we've got to, we've got to, um, uh, consider them and lift up there and weigh in their input, input a little bit more. So in dental implants, does the 360 flossing method result in peri-implantitis? Well, well, let's see. What did I find on my, on my journey when I assessed the literature? And what was I finding um, in my own experience? And, and, and do we really think that this is the best for our patients? Um, so I, I wrote a, a blog, uh, top three reasons why you shouldn't use floss around a dental implant, which um, ended up being republished on Perry Implant Advisory. And some of the things that I run through is, uh, you know, there is plenty of clinical uh, uh, case reports that uh, demonstrate that floss does contribute to Perry Implantitis. This is a clinical um, uh, uh, observation that is that is um, it was published in 2016, but it shows that in the case of 10 uh, 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 implants with peri-implantitis, floss was was a factor. And it doesn't matter what kind of floss, various kinds of floss, super floss, wax floss, non-wax floss. Um, these things were being trapped in the peri-implant sulcus. Here's another. Uh, a case report um, uh, of a single um, uh, study. And this was a patient who had a full arch. You can see your uh, mandibular bar there. And in this diagnosis, when the patient presented with peri-implantitis, this is a case where they actually used electron um, microscopy or a periodontal endoscope. Um, and you can see that uh, they were able to determine through this that it was in fact spongy floss that was trapped around um, uh, the patient's uh, fixture there. The periodontal endoscope is a wonderful tool uh, to help us to be able to not only diagnose but treat on a uh, microscope. 
endoscopic level. Trained eye, I know that this probably looks very confusing. Um, the periodontal endoscope is basically a miniature camera or a video camera that was designed to go underneath the gum tissue. So the camera gets fed into a um, sheath and so and and gets held in an explorer. So this is actually the explorer that you're seeing. This is a this is a case of, of mine that I'm showing you here. This is the explorer. The explorer is used to pull back the tissue, pull the tissue away so that we can expect the implant or the tooth surface. So this is the implant surface. And this is a patient that presented um, with peri periomucositis, um, pain, swelling, no bone loss, pain, swelling, um, uh, inflammation, and pus. So uh, after getting after asking the patient about home care, um, you know, how do we think what could have led to this? The patient shared with me that she was taking wax floss, wrapping it, tying it in into knots, and wrapping it and going 360 around her dental implant. Um, this was how her endodontist suggested that she um, maintain her dental implants at home. So when I went underneath uh, on the mesial surface of the, of the dental implant, I always forget to put the, the x-ray in here. I um, was able to capture this, what, which is what I'm suspe expecting to be dental floss. And I shared this video with two other clinicians, one dentist and one dental hygienist who also use periodontal endoscopy. And um, they confirm that this is most likely a floss fragment. So why am I telling you this? Because you, you have to, you, you got to take the research, but you also have to use your own judgment and evidence-based practice. But what are some of the other uh, experiences that um, clinicians are having? Adjustment of the prosthesis and a non-surgical phase. In the following case, however, Following non-surgical therapy, the infection had not resolved. And during surgery, you can see, if you look carefully to the middle image, that there is some dental floss firmly wrapped around the implant at the, at the neck of the implant. And this has, in fact, contributed, if not caused, the infection here. So in some instances, um, it is difficult to make an, an adequate diagnosis unless the, um, a surgical approach is used. So look out for patients who are wrapping floss around the implants and the floss is shredding. This could be a, an additional factor for, um, as a, a initiator or a factor resulting in progression of disease. We also have research dating back from 1983. Uh, this was something that was published in the journal of uh, American Dental Association, um, it, there was uh, an infection that happened uh, because the uh, patient um, had distal caries on number 30. So ultimately, if there's anything rough uh, interdentally or interproximally, for example, we know that dental implants have micro gaps. Um, there could be residual cement. Um, there can be all kinds of um, uh, risk factors. And so it's, it's no secret, it's not a new phenomenon that actually, although floss is supposed to be preventative, it can actually um, contribute to problems. So what does the evidence say? When you, when you look at what the clinicians are finding, when you look at the, what's being published in the evidence, and when we look at what's really best for our patients, in dental implants, does the 360 flossing method result in peri-implantitis? Yes, it does. So this is a technique that we really need to do away with. And I think that's why oral irrigators are starting to um, show up more and more in practice. But that is also very technique sensitive. But before we get go into the oral irrigators, um, another justification that I talked about in the, in, in the uh, article, the top three reasons why not to use floss around dental implants is that the perimucosal seal there's controversy. Should we probe them or should we not probe them? And uh, at the center of that controversy is whether or not we would be doing any damage to the perimucosal seal. Well, if we're instructing our patients to wrap floss around the dental implant, you can't tell me that they may not be possibly um, putting them, uh, damaging their own 
uh, uh, peri-implant health. And we've got to get back to reading the instructions because this is not how uh, this particular kind of floss was designed. But I know why, I know why we might hesitate um, because we think that that is the best practice. And same thing with oral irrigators. We think that that is the best practice to get 360 around the situation, to get to the buccal and the lingual surfaces. But my go-to are specialty brushes. Remember, biofilm is sticky and slimy. It still needs to be mechanically removed off. You just cannot irrigate biofilm away. Um, uh, you have to mechanically remove it. Another really great thing about specialty brushes um, is that they are uh, created for all kinds of different situations. So I can tell you that in implant dentistry, it really is like the wild, wild west. You almost never know um, what you're up against. So there really is a special toothbrush for every special uh, situation. So my go-to are still brushes. So for me, it's a specialty brush and then it's an oral irrigator because a brush for me is, is when you consider uh, dexterity and technique, uh, that is more realistic, I feel like for the patients. Um, and we know that with implant dentistry, there's larger spaces. There's all different kinds of spaces. Um, we can have spaces between the uh, actual, uh, uh, when you have a full arch restoration, you can have a situation where there's a space between the prosthetic and the tissue, so the abutment is exposed. So there are specialty brushes out there for almost every kind of challenging situation. For interdental biofilm management, my go-to are interdental brushes because it's just easy for our patients. If you are uh, recommending um, you know, oral irrigators, I hope that you are taking time to demonstrate and, um, uh, 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 and, and evaluate um, uh, the outcome of, of the patient, whether or not they're using it effectively. We know, we know that they'll use it, but are they using it properly? And just in my experience uh, in, in clinical practice, especially um, when I was providing temporary uh, hygiene services, you know, patients come in and they're all excited because they're using an oral irrigator, but they're not using it right. Uh, so I want to make it realistic. I want to make it easy. Um, when we talk about maintenance at all stages, we also have to consider what kind of specialty uh, brushes are out there for the post-surgical uh, stage. Um, if you want to, uh, if you're considering incorporating interdental brushes into your practice, you can use this code ICP40. Um, I, I don't get anything from it. It's, it's just a way to track. But sometimes dental hygienists, we have to, we have to buy our own equipment. And so this was really um, uh, created to help um, make it more affordable. So this brings the practice box down to about um, uh, 30 bucks. And something else that is really cool that's starting to come out in the literature as well is how technology is playing a role um, in influencing um, and changing our patient behaviors. We see it with the electric toothbrushes. Um, uh, Tepe, which is just one of my favorite um, uh, uh, products to use and companies to work with, they actually have an app so that while the patient is in the chair at, at your side, after you've gone through everything and they, they have their, their um, ideal, realistic at-home care plan, um, right there, you can send an email to them with their order. So literally all that patient has to do is, is press a button and um, you know, be responsible for, for getting their own supplies, but you can actually track um, if the patient has opened the email. So it's just another way using technology to help our patients um, to help increase, increase compliance so that we can increase their quality of, of life. But in conclusion, we know that high quality flossing is difficult to achieve. And I'm gonna go ahead and say that high quality oral irrigation also is very difficult to achieve. Um, interdental brushes are as good, if not superior to floss in reducing plaque and gingivitis. And for, for uh, maintaining around dental implants, oral irrigators and interdental brushes are preferred over 
floss, um, but then you have to break it down for this particular patient, would it be an interdental brush or would it be a oral irrigator? One thing is for sure though, uh, Joanne Garillion uh, talked about this in her article at a loss about floss, that oral, oral health professionals, we need to stop giving incorrect messages to our patients. Um, we just really need just, I think, to reform a lot of the ways that we do things. But, um, you know, we, we have to evaluate it on the, uh, the need of the individual and create a, a program that's customized for them and what they need. To say that one must keep flossing to keep one's teeth is the wrong message. Um, it's not based on science. What it does represent is a long lasting need to cling to tradition. So I'm not interested if my patient can floss like a boss. I'm only interested if it's realistic for them. But it does, it, it, our patients require true individualized care. This takes time. You just can't get a goodie bag and um, you know, send our patients off with it. We have to spend time educating them. We have to spend time getting to know our patients. Um, the World Health Organization's definition on, on, on wellness is the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So not only do, do, does dentistry, do we increase our patient's quality of life um, through the kind of services we provide, but we already know, especially as dental hygienists, the emotional and the spiritual the mental support that our patients also yearn from us. And this is important because, um, you know, your mental health and your mental state and, and the spirit, the inside of the person and their attitude and, and how they feel about themselves, we have to treat our patients from the inside out first. So this was a, this was a, um, uh, systematic review and meta-analyst that was published in the International Journal of Dental Hygiene. And it was a small um, study. There was, about, there was about 19 studies that were included, um, but the objective was to assess how uh, sociological theories influence um, uh, oral health interventions. Um, and, the, and the conclusion was is that in general, um, uh, psychological interventions that use other theories, um, clinical theories, uh, theory-based uh, theory of planned behavior, um, and the health belief model were, are some examples of, of the models that they, or the theories that they, can, that they looked at um, in this study. But the one that I'm most familiar with is the health belief model. Um, the health belief model was shown to have the most um, uh, uh, statistical relevance. Um, and this is actually the one that's most commonly used in research. So if we just take a, a closer look at this, um, in a nutshell, the health belief model is something that we should be implementing into practice before we even recommend treatment for our patients. Um, if you don't understand how they perceive risk consequences, like, you know, our patients know that they're supposed to use their endodental brushes, but some, sometimes they still come to the office and they'll say, I haven't done this in, you know, uh, uh, two weeks. How do they perceive the risk? How do they perceive the consequences of, of not holding to their end of, of the responsibility? And how do they perceive the benefits of, of changing their behavior, of, of being more compliant in their home care? We have to um, help show them how this can increase their, their quality of life. And if we have patients that um, are not changing their behavior, what's in the way? Just flat out ask our patients why. And if it's something that has to do with, um, you, know, uh, 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 you know, mental or emotional, whatever it is, how can we help our patients overcome? How can we more, be more confident? And most importantly, how do we spark change? You know, our patients need more than just oral hygiene instructions. They need willpower. They need to be inspired. They need to be under, understood. They um, need to value themselves. They need to um, uh, also advocate um, for, their, for their overall health. 
Um, we all have a sense of willpower, but what do some people seem to have? Why do some people seem to have so much will, willpower? You have those patients that just are great. They say yes to everything. And they have those, and then we have those other patients that we, we just can't seem to, to touch. We, can't, we just can't seem to, to get through. And that is because people need a strong sense of purpose. Um, you know, your attitude about life your belief system, your philosophy, this all has an influence on, um, uh, you know, determines your leadership. And our patients are leaderships as well. We have to make them the, um, we have to make them their own advocates, um, you know, and we can't do that if we, if we don't um, care for our patients on a personal level. Right, because educating the mind without educating the heart is no educated education at all. And dental hygienists, we just have to remember what drives us, what our purpose is, and that is prevention. And most importantly, that is uh, wellness, and that is the um, uh, the happiness of our patients. I think that um, you know, uh, uh, dentistry from a from a podium standpoint, what we're learning at our continuing education courses um, is way faster than what we're seeing in 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 um, in clinic, especially in dental hygiene. Uh, this is just an example of some things that we try to get past this year um, and the ADHA House of Delegates. We wanted to bring more attention to, for example, um, uh, wellness and what does that mean in the holistic approach and realizing that it's not just the body that we are caring for, but it's the mind and the spirit. So hopefully, hopefully what we're seeing and, and research, what we're talking about on the podium and what we're doing in clinic will, will hopefully catch up to each other because we can't uh, really impact our patients' lives if we don't help them heal um, um, on the inside, if we don't give them that willpower. And when it comes to full, full mouth, um, uh, uh, your, your, um, your full mouth dental implant population, this really has to be an out of the box approach because I don't think that it's a manual toothbrush. I don't, your traditional manual toothbrush, electric toothbrushes, we really need to, um, uh, be more critic, think more critically about, um, you know, if these these things that we're recommending recommending for our patients are really um, uh, effective, if it's if it's if it's practical, is it really what the patient needs? I particularly like to recommend this brush. This is called the Big Brush from Radius. Uh, it's really good to use. It helps with dexterity, but most importantly, it has a super sized brush head with three times more the bristles. Um, and it's real, uh, it's got some good um, uh, uh, environmental um, uh, qualities about it. Like the, the entire brush handle is, is recyclable. But I'm, I started recommending this for my patients with full arch because just by having conversations with my patients. And if we try to put ourselves in their shoes and think how they think, you know, patients think that they just have to brush teeth. But when they have full arch, their the surface area, their responsibility is so much more. So something like this in your full arch fixed situation is more realistic to me than a manual toothbrush or an electric toothbrush. In this responsibility, uh, in this situation, patients are to be um, cleaning the surface of the prosthetic and not so much focusing um, uh, in the other aspects. But let me show you, I have an image that will help um, give you a bit of better vision of what I'm saying. Um, it just It's just so much challenging. Um, my patients have shared with me that there's really nothing. I was recommending this universal care brush here that you see on the left side, but patients were, were we know that even in natural teeth, some of the chap most challenging areas to get to are the lower posterior linguals. So for your full arch patients, depending on the design of the prosthetic, how much bone, uh, uh, the depth of the flange, we need brushes that are more ergonomically make sense for our patients with full arch. So when you when you have the full arch, this is what I was trying to explain earlier, you have to, you have to think of the sulcus, you have to think of interdentally, and you also have to remember the prosthetic. So patients are using a variety of brushes. 
I think that the best oral hygiene measures, the best practices is number one, get inside your patient, personally connect with your patient, um, help to understand their spirit, their procession, their release, where they come from, why it's so hard for them to um, you know, change their oral hygiene behaviors. But um, at least I know that with, with, um, with three, and then you have to figure out, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. And then you have to figure out after you get to know who they are, you have to really figure out what's best for them. But I choose, inter, I choose specialty brushes because I don't have to worry about floss induced peri-implantitis. I don't have to worry about tempering with the perimucosal seal. And um, uh, also oral irrigation is safe for cement retained uh, restorations. I had a prosthodontist one time um, uh, uh, was upset with me because I recommended an oral irrigator for a full arch patient or um, um, uh, a bridge. And um, he felt as though that it can um, uh, dissolve the cement, cement. And that's just simply not true. So uh, I know there's probably questions about uh, water picks, new tip that they've come out with for full arch. I have not tried it yet. Um, I don't know anybody who has, but it looks great. It looks promising. But you have to know the difference between with oral irrigation, we have non-magnetic and we have magnetic. And I just really, you know, there's great, um, uh, for example, water pick is a, is a non-magnetic and they have a lot of research to, you know, it, it works. It's just what is, can be more effective. And so, um, I started learning about um, uh, uh, magnetic oral irrigators and the science behind it. And basically the science of, of magnetics is, is proven to be more effective because when the water is going through the handle, uh, it's going through, it, it, uh, it polarizes. So um, in the mouth, it prevents uh, um, any liquids from turning into a, a solid, for example, uh, biofilm from going to plaque, from going to calculus. So over time, it makes it so biofilm does not stick. And there are clinical, uh, there are there is literature. It's old literature, um, uh, but you know studies have shown that magnetic uh, magnetic oral irrigators are more effective in reducing um, uh, uh, plaque buildup, calculus, and inflammation. But you know, I, I hope none of this stuff uh, uh, looked new to you because you know, oral irrigation has been here since 1962. Interdental brushes have been here since 1976, and uh, specialty brushes have been here since 1980. So why are we still mainly saying toothbrushing and flossing? It's definitely time for dental hygiene to um, adopt technologies because the future is right now. Um, and you can contact me. I like to, to, to talk to you more about um, programs that can help um, you feel more comfortable in your practice as you're caring for patients with dental implants. And just know that if dentists are going to be placing implants, then they have to give the dental hygienist um, the appropriate equipment and time uh, uh, to, treat, to treat the patient because um, it really uh, does require a non-traditional approach because dental implants are not teeth. You can email me at srhrdh at gmail.com. You can uh, follow up on Facebook or Instagram. Look out for the Dental Implants Uncovered study group on Facebook. We have an Instagram page. The Facebook group is really cool because um, it, it truly was meant to be a place for dental hygienists to increase their, their knowledge on implant dentistry. So thank you, Plan Mecca, for this special offer, um, which is only exclusive for um, our colleagues who are with us today on the call. So be sure to take a screenshot of that. I do use LM Dental. Uh, instruments, um, and uh, I recommend them. So thank you for being here with me today. And I hope you uh, took at least one thing that you can take away and apply to your practice. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Siobhan. Such great information presented today um, on the oral hygiene for their dental implants and, and helping ultimately the patient, right? So we can go ahead and open it up for Q&A. I did see a few come through. And um, just a reminder too, if you do want to take advantage of the LM instrument promo, use promo code Healy25 for 25% off your entire order. And you can shop at shop.planmecca usa.com. I did send the link through the chat as well. I also did uh, send the link for the um, CE credits as well. And when you submit your CE credits, you're going to use that code right below it or the number 690. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we're happy to help. And um, we'll go ahead and open it up for Q&A. All right, thank you. So I took a look at what's in the question and answer box. Um, and I see that we have a question that uh, goes a little like this. How do you feel about the use of fluoride varnish around implants to help control biofilm? And what are your thoughts um, on using a xylitol product to control biofilm? These are not things that I use in my practice. Uh, however, I know clinicians that do, and um, uh, as far as the, the, the varnish is concerned, um, uh, when you're talking about fluoride varnish, um, there is varnish for dental implants, but it's, it's chlorhexidine based. So let me back myself up a little bit. You, dental implants will never get a cavity. It's the disease in the tissue. So you don't need to be putting fluoride varnish around dental implants. However, there is, uh, like I said, uh, varnish that is uh, 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 chlorhexidine based. Um, and the uh, information from my colleagues is that it, it, you know, it works well when you have exposed threads. Because um, remember, if you don't have exposed threads, uh, that's great. The implant is in the bone, things are healthy, and you only have the prosthetic um, that is, uh, uh, that you can see clinically. Uh, so from my understanding of my colleagues that are using it, they use it when in a situation where there is exposed threads. Xylitol is a great product. Um, I recommend it in any form. I know it comes in gum, it comes in toothpaste, it comes in all uh, different forms. And um, xylitol is really great for uh, the diabetic patient too, because it doesn't um, cause the blood pressure to increase. So it's safe. It's a great product. So I, I recommend it. Um, we have another question that says, what is the name of the magnetic irrigator? It's Hydrofloss, Hydrofloss. And if you contact them, they will actually do a, um, it's not a webinar, it's a lunch and learn. Hopefully they're still doing it, but ask. Um, but in the past, they provide like a lunch and learn for the entire office where they go through step-by-step uh, step the equipment, and then everybody in the office who participated gets a free unit. So look into that. Um, if you need help, you can definitely contact me at srhrdh at gmail.com. And let's see. And that's all I see here for questions. Siobhan, do you want to put your contact information up one more time? There was a, a message sure. through the, the chat um, just so sure. they can reach out to you. And we're just a few minutes over time. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us. And for those of you that stayed on a little bit late, want to be respectful of everybody's time. But um, hope to see you on a future webinar with Plan Mecca. And um, don't forget to order your LM instruments. Take advantage of, of that offer. And uh, have a wonderful week. Thanks again, Siobhan. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Take care. Mm -hmm.